and I'm sitting here in the newsroom in St. Louis, and I'm going to make a test of this jolly little cassette, and here's how Ben Stong sounds. Would you care to say a few words? Yes, I would care to say several words, but I can tell you without saying them that he sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, vintage Stong there. Horace, in your talk to this group this evening, uh, you made the point that you're a consumer, and yet everyone knows that you were one of the organizers and leaders of the NFO in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, what about that? Well, that's true, Phil. I am a consumer. Uh, I have no agricultural production, although I deal, still own some land. Um, I enjoy cheap food prices. It's interesting and, and nice to be able to go to the supermarket and come home with a food basket and only use about 16% of my net disposable income. But I'm concerned about the farmer, and the family farmer is the one that has been paying for this cheap food. And I see other people, myself included, who are enhancing our income through the use of collective bargaining. And still farmers are having such an awful time seeing how it can be done. Uh, there's no reason why farmers can't improve their economic lot through the use of collective bargaining. Uh, they're, they're the only ones that can do it unless they see the, the vision and are able to work together in a unified manner they're going to disappear from the scene, as the college professors have already said. Thanks very much. That was Oris Kinerva, a member of the NFO National Board from Minnesota in the 1960s and one of the organizers of the NFO and uh, speaks at NFO meetings and community gatherings during the season when organizing is being done. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about. Now, Oris, as a building contractor, you're in an industry that's very much influenced by collective bargaining, aren't you? Uh, this is true. Uh, we deal with uh, union people at all, at all times. And an interesting thing to me is that when I went back in the business with my son in 73, we were contracting, just for illustration, we were contracting brickwork at uh, $160 a thousand. Now we're getting almost $300 a thousand. All of this because of increase in cost and increase in labor due to collective bargaining. Uh, in the, the same period of time, uh, farmers have not had an increase in their income to speak of. And as in the case of grain, they're now getting less for wheat than they were in 73. I'm visiting now on the floor of the 1978 convention at St. Louis with a Michigan farmer, Leonard Harrington. He's a young guy, and he joined the NFO recently. Where is your farm located, Leonard? Center of Michigan, near Lansing, Diamonddale, specifically. What kind of a farm operation is it? It's a partnership operation dealing primarily in grains. Now, they told me before I came up here to sit beside you here in the Michigan delegation that you had joined the NFO recently. When was it? We joined a year ago in January. What caused you to decide to join the National Farmers Organization? Well, as I look over all of the farm organizations, there is only one thing that can help the farmer. That's for him to put a price on it. Uh, the National Farmers Organization is the only one willing to do that. Now, just in general terms, uh, you seem an experienced farmer, and uh, I noticed that you're articulate. Uh, in your experience with other attempts to solve agriculture's problems, uh, what are some of the ones in a general sort of way that you think, well, maybe are well-intentioned but aren't going to make it that cause you to say, okay, I'll join NFO? Well, I think they're all well-intentioned, uh, and I think we need to pursue all avenues, including the legislative ones that uh, AAM is pursuing. I supported AAM. I still support them, but I feel that collective bargaining is the only one that can work. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's apparent to most anyone who's followed AAM that they were pretty strong on a legislative approach, weren't they? Well, they still are, uh, as is Farm Bureau. Uh, Farm Bureau still feels that we should legislate. The thing that needs to happen is for all of these farm organizations to get themselves together with one common goal. Yeah, and the NFO's collective bargaining approach, you feel, is what ultimately they're going to have to do. I feel it is the only one. No one is going to give you more money from, for your product unless you're willing to tell them that you need it. Uh, and individually running around saying, hey, we've got to have more for our product isn't going to do the job. If we put our production together, 
put a price on it, they have to buy it. Let me ask you a question about you personally. Uh, you grew up on a farm? No, I did not. I was a, a city dweller. I grew up, I went to college, studied forestry. I ran my own business, train landscape business, for about 15 years. We then uh, took a job as city forester for the city of East Lansing. And three years ago, we decided we wanted to farm. Uh, I don't have a great long farm background, but I do have a business background, and you can't continue to operate in a loss. This would be very interesting, I'd think, to listeners, rural or urban, that uh, in the study of forestry, tell about that. How, how do you go about studying forestry, and where did you study? I studied at Michigan State University. Uh, got my degree in 1963. Then I went back and took an additional four years of education in a variety of fields from business law to accounting. Uh, to study forestry is no different than the study of any other profession. You deal with the background, you deal with the basics, uh, and you deal with uh, life. I feel that was the biggest thing I gained from college education was that you learn that answers are available and you learn where to look for them. In the study of forestry and the other studies that you had associated with it, uh, were you especially interested in the economic aspects of forestry? Well, I guess uh, there was an old gentleman in my background that once told me that uh, if you study how to make money, you can ultimately do so. Uh, I'm still trying to find out exactly how that happens. I have studied uh, economics, and the deeper I get into it, the more uh, interested I become. Uh, Arnold Paulson's talk last night uh, opened an awful lot of doors and going to have me reading for the next several months. Yeah, very good. Uh, I've been talking with I'll start this part of the tape over again when we edit the tape. Uh, this has been a conversation with Leonard Harrington, a young farmer from near East Lansing, Michigan, who joined the NFO within the past year or so. Thanks very much, Leonard. Thank you. Charles Fraser, who heads the Washington office of the NFO, has just addressed the delegate body at this 1978 convention in St. Louis of the National Farmers Organization. He mentioned during his address what could develop into an attack on the Capra Volstead Act and said that it might happen in this next session of Congress. Mr. Fraser, how come it would be developing right now or <clears throat> in this next session? Well, all right. Throw me the question. How come it would develop in this next session of Congress? Well, Phil, perhaps first we must all remind ourselves of the purpose of the antitrust laws to understand how we're in the question that we have before us today. Or should we say how and why we may be confronted with a serious challenge on the Capra Volstead Act. The overall purpose of the antitrust laws, of course, is to assure competition among various businesses by making it illegal for them to get together in some form of collusion in pricing their products. Unfair marketing practices that would tend to undercut a competitor and run him out of business are prohibited by these laws. Our interest, of course, runs to the exemptions to these laws which permit some people to act collectively because that's believed to be in the best public interest. Are farmers the only ones who are permitted as an exception to these laws to act together? Not by any means. For example, the trucking industry enjoys certain rate-setting privileges. The airlines have some exemption to the antitrust laws. Our overseas shipping that move our commodities abroad is involved in a rate-setting structure by some international body in which our shippers participate. Perhaps most important of all, our insurance companies are permitted to go before a state 
authority and get approval of an established set of premium rates on many of our important insurance policies in this country. Now it happens. We are most interested in the Capra Volstead exemption, which permits farmers to get together in a cooperative or bargaining organization and price their own product. Now, there's some kind of a commission that's to study all of these exemptions, as I understand it. Oh, tell us about that, Chuck. A commission to review all of the antitrust exemptions and the Justice and Federal Trade Commission policies in prosecuting antitrust cases was established by the President last year pursuant to a joint resolution passed by the Congress. This commission is made up of the high-ranking members, both Democratic and Republican, of the Judiciary Committees of the Senate and the House, the presiding officers, if you please, at Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission, and a number of well-recognized members of the legal profession from wide-ranging types of practice in this country. Most of these individuals have great experience and respect for the administration of the antitrust laws. One of the first charges placed on this commission by the President was to examine the content of the antitrust laws as well as their procedures in prosecuting antitrust cases because all too often it may take 5, 7, 10, or 15 years for the Justice Department to prosecute an antitrust violation by a huge corporation that may be acting, who may be operating in some segment of our economy. A number of those cases are in court now, and the public naturally is quite disgusted because they're dragged out over a number of years, and we seem to accomplish so little under the antitrust laws that are of real importance in the fair and competitive pricing of products to the American people. So there is a need to look into the antitrust laws and the exemptions to them, and this unfortunately could include the Capra Volstead Act and uh, its general authority for cooperatives or farmers to act together. As we all know, there's been a great deal of public concern in recent years about the rise in food prices in this country. There are some well-meaning people who believe that a part of these food price increases may be attributable to some of our marketing order systems or the operation of widely based farmer cooperative marketing structures. Now, of course, we do not believe that these bargaining and cooperative marketing actions on the part of producers has unduly enhanced the prices of food products. We know that those segments of the food cost attributable to the manufacturing, processing, marketing, and retailing of food products in this country have risen much faster than the prices we receive for our raw products. Consequently, we're going to look with a jaundiced eye on any efforts made either by the Commission's actions and recommendations or in the Congress following the report from the Commission to modify or seriously limit the value of 
the Capra Volstead Act of 1922 to farmers in this country. Well, Chuck, what do you think that farmers on the farm or in the member in their congressional districts or at home, what can they do to make Congress better aware of the need for Capra Volstead? At this point in time, I hope that all producers, regardless of which cooperative or marketing or bargaining organization they may use, will watch for the reports of this commission that should come out this winter in Washington, and particularly watch for any recommendations for legislation that would restrict or otherwise hamper the operation of the Capra Volstead Act under which so many of our farm outfits are organized. Let me try it again. With what can people do? I think all farmers and ranchers who have an interest in bargaining or cooperative marketing ought to watch for the reports that will be released by this commission that's reviewing the antitrust laws. We will probably be challenged with legislation that will be formulated following the report of the commission. At that point in time, all of us must make an effort to understand exactly what they're recommending, and then we can move accordingly with our senators and our members of Congress. Most people have a sense of fairness, Chuck. What do you think about that, of um, amending farmers out of their right to bargain collectively while other segments maybe still can get together? I think we're faced with the same set of principles or challenges today that prevailed in the 1920s when the Congress first passed the Capra Volstead Act. The original purpose of that legislation was to enable farmers to bargain collectively in dealing with the huge corporations and other business enterprises to whom they must sell their farm products. To deny farmers or to restrict their opportunity to act collectively in their own best interest would not be appropriate today any more than it would have been in years past. We are still challenged to get a fair price for our products when we take them to town. Okay. This is a conversation with Erhard Finkston, who was vice president of the NFO in the 1960s, and he has addressed the ladies' meeting at this convention in St. Louis. Uh, the famous jackass story that you told, uh, is that really true, Fink? Well, it's a little exaggerated, let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, place it for me in both time and when and where. Well, the time I'm referring to, of course, would probably be around 1920, about that period of time, and I was born and raised in Gage County, Nebraska, 12 and a half miles northwest of Beatrice, so that's the area. Okay, about when would it have been? It have been around 1919, 1920, 21. Yeah, when they were still hauling grain market and wagon. Yeah, we hadn't heard of trucks then, and not in that area, I know, and I just don't suppose in any others either. I imagine a lot of people listening to this radio program have attended meetings you've addressed all across the United States. Uh, tell us about that. Are you likely to go out on the hustings again? Well, physically, really not able to. Uh, I'm not in the best of health. I hate to complain about it, and yet I do just fine as long as I take it relatively easy. But I have a combination of a problem of both heart and lungs, and I guess I quit smoking about 10 years too late. And as long as there isn't too much movement or exercise or strain, I get along fine, and if I overdo it, I go down quick. And your appearance here at this convention in St. Louis was before, well, before one of the important functions, the Tuesday night session, the ladies' meeting, as it's now called, and it dates back to Butch Williams' time, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, well, really, there were, I would say, three men to every lady in the particular meeting, but the group 
consisted basically of the people who are in charge of public relations out in the country and uh, let's say pretty much putting the word out and keeping people informed and so it is for that reason to let's say give them a lift that I did it. Everyone around here is saying it's one of the best of those Tuesday sessions we've had in years, Fink. Well, I'm glad of that, but we had two other terrific speakers on there too, you know. That's right. So, Red Paulson and... Uh, that's right, Red Paulson and Oris Canerva. Uh, one last question I'd like to... For those of you and those people in the audience who are young enough that they don't quite remember when it was that you were vice president. Tell about that. When were you vice president of the NFO? I was elected vice president in 1962, December of 1962, and I stepped down in December of 1971. Before then, you were an organizer for the NFO. Just a word about that. Well, I organized northwest Iowa, southwest Minnesota, and then was became pretty much what you would call uh, or we call a national speaker speaking all over the United States. I was also elected to the national board and in 1961 I was the first head of the meat commodity department, director of the meat commodity department, and then was elected in 1962 as national vice president. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks very much and we hope we see you at some more of these. That's Earhart Fingston Vice President of the National Farmers Organization during the 1960s and one of the early day organizers of the NFO. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about. I'm having a conversation now with Dr. Leonard Haverkamp, who is Vice President in charge of economic research for Wilson and Company. Uh, is Wilson the largest pork producer? They oftentimes are described as that, aren't they, Leonard? We think so. They're Phil, we don't have any actual government statistics show, listing each of the individual companies showing exactly how many hogs they slaughtered and so forth, but we think we are. At any rate, you're deeply involved in pork processing. We sure are. We have nine plants, ten plants, in fact, where we slaughter hogs, ranging all the way from Oklahoma City on the southwest to Louisville on the southeast and up to Albert Lee, Minnesota on the north. This conversation is taking place uh, just after uh, Leonard Haverkamp talked to uh, the uh, one of the, well, it's probably the biggest session that the hog division of the NFO is having at the St. Louis Convention. And we're at the convention center in St. Louis now. One point that I was intrigued by in your talk to the NFO delegates, you talked about the export market and you mentioned that Canada and Japan are the best customers of uh, the American hog producer. And then you talked about what's happening in Japan. They seem to be interested in increasing their own pork production, but they have to buy the inputs for the hog. In other words, they import the grain. Talk about that in terms of efficiency. Well, <clears throat> Phil, my point regarding Japan, at picking them out as an example, I could have picked out a Western European country, but uh, they have a small island there, and I personally am always amazed by the way in which they are attempting to enlarge their own uh, livestock industry. They are buying grain and soybeans from us. They uh, look at us and say we can't match the Americans in terms of the efficiency with which they with which Americans produce corn and soybeans but by golly we're going to be self-sufficient in producing the hogs and producing the broilers and uh, that we will do ourselves. and so uh, hog production is growing by leaps and bounds there their their demand for pork consumer demand for pork is going up without any question over just the past three years why it's gone up uh, at the rate of about six to seven percent per year and uh, uh, the the point is though that when we try to uh, increase our exports of pork from here to Japan why it's a rough road to hoe they have very tight quotas and uh, they're only going to import so much. In other words, they're, they're uh, trying to 
uh, to uh, expand their domestic hog production, and we are fighting to try and sell them more pork. And so it's uh, it could be a good friendly battle, but I wish it were fought along strictly free enterprise lines because I personally feel that if we didn't have so much government interference in the way of the quotas and so forth, that the American hog producer and the American packer are efficient enough so that we could uh, actually export pork to them and uh, instead of having them to go to all of the inefficiency of uh, raising their own hogs. I don't think they can do it as efficiently as we can, Phil. You gave some arithmetic bearing on how many pounds of, of feed grains have to be shipped overseas in yep. comparison to how many pounds of pork. We're, we've been, uh, Wilson sells them uh, uh, pork and they're interested in pork butts and they buy loins and in the past year or so they have been buying much more lo boneless product than bone in. A few years ago they bought bone in but now with the boneless product why okay that has a yield of maybe 70 a boneless loin is maybe 60 percent of the weight of a bone in loin and if you take think of that 60 percent in combination with the fact that it takes at least uh, something on the order of four pounds of feed to produce a pound of live hog and I was just putting that four pounds there to Together with the yield difference of 70%, why it really the equivalent then is is to take six or seven pounds of feed to produce a pound of boneless pork loin. That was the point I made. And uh, if you compare the transportation cost, why uh, we can we can compete in selling meat. Sure, it has to go over there refrigerated, and uh, the cost per pound transportation is more than a pound of grain. But you're com you should be comparing six to seven pounds with of the grain with one pound of the uh, boneless pork loin. Follow That's me? a very good point. I've heard economists talk about this going on right here in the United States that because of our advanced technology we seem to be shipping things back and forth across the continental United States and here you're making the point that this is going on overseas clear yeah. across the Pacific. Uh, you made another point that I like uh, the ability of the independent hog producer to lick his own problems. You know a lot of family-sized hog operations or any livestock any kind of family-sized farming. Sometimes the people out there on the land get discouraged and they say, well, with the corporate investment and all that, they're going to snow us under and they can uh, be more efficient. What about that? You had some encouragement there about the ability of the family-sized guy to lick his own problems. Oh, I, uh, sh uh, it's the way it looks to me, Phil. People, I think, take a look at the broiler industry and immediately get qualms that the only way that you can get real efficient these days is to get into vertical integration like the broiler people have. And I just don't think that uh, in the case that the, I think that the hog business is enough different because so that the comparison is not valid. Uh, the I would say that 95 percent probably of all of the potential efficiency in producing a hog most efficiently and slaughtering it, carrying it through, uh, can be achieved uh, uh, through good vertical coordination. And it's not necessary at all to uh, for one party, for uh, like an integrator, to uh, uh, control our own the whole production and processing operation from beginning to end and uh, so uh, whether you talk about pigs saved per litter whether you talk about uh, uh, feed conversion whether you talk about better breeding the independent producer can achieve uh, the 99 percent of those economies bringing in an integrator to to uh, try and capture that last uh, tenth of one percent isn't going to help much. You made a good distinction in your use of the word vertical coordination. What did you mean by that as, as compared to vertical integration? Oh, uh, vertical coordination is uh, the kind of thing that we have that's been going on for a long time when people are working together like the producer uh, 
with his feed supplier or even with his banker or with the, even with a packer, but where you have, think of, a, of some kind of an agreement. It can be an, a very informal or it can be a formal contractual arrangement. You can have something poured in concrete and written out or it can be quite informal. But you have an agreement uh, that you're, each party is going to contribute something and uh, at, the, at the end why both parties will benefit. It will be for their mutual benefit, but neither of the parties gives up control of his operation. And so uh, it's through this kind of coordination, think of it as working together more closely, uh, that is going to achieve that last bit of efficiency that we must work to achieve. And uh, so that's coordination, whereas vertical integration <clears throat> refers to actually controlling, taking over, owning uh, the whole process from beginning to end, from cradle to grave. And that's why I'm saying isn't necessary, Phil. I think you've saved the essential point with that concept, that the, uh, the independent producer doesn't like to give over all the management decisions to an integrator. I would think that's true. I'm, I'm sure that's true. He, he prefers to uh, run his own show. And uh, <clears throat> so what is to be gained by going into an integrated operation where you have a single party controlling everything if you don't gain in anything extra in efficiency? I'm saying the broader people maybe didn't make a mistake, but that industry is different. They did gain a lot of things that couldn't have been achieved in any other way, but I'm saying the hog industry is not like the broader industry. I think your answer here has suggested my next question. Why would you, uh, an economist from Wilson & Company, a big pork processor, take the time to come out and talk to members of a farm organization and answer their questions the way you're doing all day yesterday and today? Oh, uh, I suppose you'd say, what have we got to, what do we have to gain? Well, let's look at the selfish interest first. We are interested in a growing and a thriving and a healthy pork industry from beginning to end. If uh, and that starts with the producer and if the producer gets discouraged and if he uh, uh, can't operate successfully, uh, why well, this industry is going to suffer and their hog production will decline, the industry will shrink and uh, if it take it to the very extreme, if it goes down the tube, why well, that's the end of Wilson also. So that's the reason why uh, I think with the basic strong demand that we have for pork and pork products, it's a shame for anything like this to happen. And so I think we should all work together and get all of the facts out on the table and uh, see what accurately diagnose and define the problems and then work together to solve them. Just a personal question to uh, kind of close this little conversation. Now, you're an economist. Uh, uh, a PhD. They refer to you as Dr. Haverkamp. Yeah. How do you how do you get from where you started, and you have a rural background? I noticed that you had uh, a lot of chuckles while uh, Orville Cockrell was talking, and he was giving off some of his good old Kentucky stories. And you told me that you came from that area too. How do you come from there to where you are now, a chief economist for a big pork processor? You mean right from the very beginning? Uh, yeah. in the how, did, how did you get interested in going from where you were? And, uh, oh, just tell me things like where you studied and all that. Oh, sure. Uh, be, be glad to. I started out on a little livestock farm in southeastern Indiana, right across the river from Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. Didn't hear of that one, did you? <laughs> and uh, so then I heard that there was a place up in the northern end of the state called uh, Purdue University and I decided that maybe I ought to try and learn something more and I went up there and I got so interested that I just kept going to school and couldn't stop till I had gone through a, a bachelor's degree and a master's and a PhD and then one day some people came down from uh, a company in Chicago 
called Wilson and Company, and they said that they s slaughtered a lot of hogs and produced a lot of pork and so forth. And with my background in economics and farm background, that they had some things that they thought that I could do that would be worthwhile. And so, uh, since I uh, knew I couldn't go to school all my life, and uh, it was desirable to keep body and soul together. Why, well, we got together in vertical coordination, shall we say? <laughs> and uh, then I got in a deep rut, and I have been with Wilson all my life. I, it's the only job I've ever had. I see. How many years altogether have you been with Wilson and Company? Thirty-three and a half. So. I think that the radio audience can understand from that that we're talking to a man who knows perhaps as much about the hog industry, the pork industry, as anyone you can talk to. And he's been one of the principal guest speakers at this 1978 convention of the National Farmers Organization at St. Louis. Uh, nice to have you on the program again, Leonard. It's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to come here, Phil. Thanks very much for asking me. Phil Allen for NFO News, and that for today is something to think about. Well, Orville Cockrell, you made a very good point about uh, the aggressiveness of export, uh, exporting certain American agricultural products. Uh, what was the distinction you made between uh, exporting feed grains and the actual meat products? Well, it seemed to me that uh, over the past few years, uh, as a country, perhaps as a government, we've been much more aggressive in in promoting the uh, the sale of grains, and we have the sale of uh, of meat. Uh, this, of course, is uh, an easier thing to handle. I suppose uh, maybe some of it stems from the fact that it's easier to handle grain than it is meat. But it also stems from the fact that the grain people, I believe, have been more aggressive in promoting their products uh, throughout the world markets. You see uh, groups from Illinois, for example, which is a state that I come from, sending delegations to Japan, to Europe, to sell soybeans and corn. Very seldom do you see anybody send in a delegation to sell pork or poultry. I, I feel that we've done a, a much better job of promoting our grains than we have our meats. In the magazine you published, Pig American, do you have, uh, I suppose you have a chance to express this thought in your magazine? Yes, we do. Uh, we have an opportunity, of course, not only to, ex to export uh, uh, the product, the consumer product, but we also promote the exporting of uh, breeding stock, of, uh, of uh, the technology that we have that many other areas of the world uh, can use. Uh, and this takes the form of, uh, of products such as breeding stock, for example, which we export to other countries. Before I get to uh, one last topic I'd like to ask you about, your feeling, uh, which you expressed in the talk, about the ability of the independent producer to handle his own problem. Uh, just one other question before that. Tell me a little more about Pig American. How old is this publication, and what is its circulation, and on what basis? Uh, Pig American is uh, is in its uh, fourth year now as a publication. It's an outgrowth of a publication which we have called Pig International that circulates outside the United States. Uh, we felt that the information being developed there was could be made applicable to the U.S. producer, and so that's the reason for Pig American. We attempt to to uh, gather technological information, economic information from all over the world and make it applicable to Americans. It has, Pig America now has a circulation of 50,000. We go only to people who, uh, who have, um, who market at least 500 hogs per year. And with that 50,000 circulation, we estimate that we cover approximately 80% of all the hogs marketed in the United States. Uh, Where all is it edited and uh, written? Our, our editor, of course, is located in Mount Morris, Illinois, but we also utilize the staff uh, all over the world. We have an office in Midhurst, England. We have one in Zeist, Holland. And we have an office in Redlands, California, one in Coleman, Alabama, and one in Seattle City, New Jersey. So we have editors in all those spots as well as using correspondents in other parts of the world. I notice you got good response from the delegates here at the National Farmers Organization Convention in St. Louis when you talked about the ability of the independent producer to survive and lick his own problems. What about that? Well, maybe I can ask it this way. How come you would take the trouble to come out here and talk to and answer questions from a farm organization convention? 
Well, I'm very high on, uh, on the opportunities in the, in the future of the American farmer, particularly as it has to do with uh, hog production. I feel that this is the way it is going. Uh, producing hogs is in a family affair in most operations that I know anything about. You see the very rapid growth of large family operations where they're producing enough hogs to really provide a livelihood on the farm. And I feel that this is the, the wave of the future and the way the industry is developing. Uh, we, are, we want to be a part of it as a, as a communications medium for that industry. And that's why it's a real privilege for me to have the opportunity to be out here to talk to people who are on the, the leading edge of this development. It's a real pleasure. One of the uh, old Kentucky stories you were telling got a laugh from the crowd, and I, I didn't quite understand it. Maybe I'm the proverbial Englishman, slow to catch the point of a joke. <laughs> you were talking about wet feed and dry feed of hogs. What, what was the story on that? Well, the, the story was that wet feeding, of course, is a, a growing thing in s some parts of Western Europe, and I think even in the United States. And I was making the comparison because as a kid on a farm in Kentucky, I carried the slop, what we call the slop. Yes, I remember the expression. Out to the hog. So I consider that to be one of the original wet feed operations uh, that we had there. And uh, people thought that was kind of funny. We don't do that anymore, I gather. <laughs> yeah, they even used the word as a verb, slop the hogs, <laughs> right? Slop the hogs, that's right. <laughs> I've been talking with Orville Cockrell, publisher of Pig American, who is one of the principal guest speakers at this convention of the National Farmers Organization at St. Louis. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about.